My name is Darwin German, and I'd like to welcome back Ben Garland. I was lucky enough to spend 11 years in the NFL, and today I'm an investor trying to use some of that money to make more of it. My big thing is I worked way too hard and long to earn that money. I got fingers that go the wrong direction. How are you going to make sure when I invest with you to protect my capital? Well, everything is investors first. We think about you first. The good part about that is it actually trickles down. What's best for you is best for our employees, which is best for our residents and best for that city. And it all goes to making you more money. But we really have to mitigate risk. That's a big part of it. And we try to spend more time on minimizing risk rather than maximizing our gains. And because of that, there's a lot of things that we put into place. And it all starts with, your, with our underwriting. I appreciate that. What, what is underwriting? So when somebody puts a property up for sale or they want to sell it, they, have, they hire a broker, puts together an OM, offering memorandum, and that's their sales pitch about the property. And of course, it is a sales pitch. So you can't rely 100% on that because they make it all sound great. So what you do is you get that as a starting point. And a lot of times they don't put, they put a price on things. So you have to actually have to find out what their estimated sales price is. They call that a whisper price. So we take that whisper price, we take that OM, and then we look directly at their 12-month financials. What has the property actually been doing? And we look at their rent roll to verify what their rents are, because um, over time, your rents might be here in January and here in December. And so we have to look at what the last few leases were signed to see where we are at market rent today. Because if we use 12 months worth of income, it's gonna be lower than where we are right now, just by nature of the fact that income goes up. First thing we do when we get an OM is we look at the area, we look at the age. Um, a lot of times we've seen these properties turn before or we've owned near there, so we have a good idea of that particular market, that particular demographic, it's, if it's something we want to even pursue. We already have basic uh, debt underwriting, so we know what that should be. So we plug those numbers in there. The first big variable is we have the rent roll so we can put in effective rents, what they're actually getting right now. But then we also look at all the competition. So the next step is we're looking at all the competition to see where we stack up. And is there room to raise rents right now? We have to look at the condition of the property to say, if we spend money on this property, can we increase the value? Can we increase the rents, which increases the value? So we need a CapEx number on how much money we're gonna put into that. Am I getting too detailed just out of curiosity? No, I'm loving it. Okay. This is a lot of great information. Okay, so we have to come up with our CapEx number, capital improvements, because that way we can say, if we put this amount of money into the property, what can our performer rents be? On a stabilized property, there's not a lot of upside. Using the market as an example, they just went through a lease up. So when you're doing a lease up, you have very low rents and then you raise the rents um, over time. Well, if we do a new lease now, we'll have a higher rental rate than when they first moved in. And so what that is, is, is that's a burn off. Okay, we've got to burn off the concessions that were given back in that time. So we have to look at what our performer rents are. And there's a little bit of an art to that rather than just science. Because we need to look at everything in the market. We need to say, here's what market rents should be. Here's what they would be if we put money into it. And an easy way to do that is if we put X amount of dollars into a property, we know we should get some of the top end of the rent. So we can put our performer rent in there. That tells us the maximum potential rent. Then we take off what vacancy factor would be for that market. And a lot of times people advertise that it's 5% vacant or 3%, 95% occupied, 98% occupied. Doesn't matter whether they say that, I'll take it down to at least eight, maybe 10% vacancy and collection loss together. Then we add back in the other income that they're already doing. And then we look at that and say, how can we add value? Where can we get additional revenue from? And that might be um, covered parking, uh, assigned parking. Um, we've got a tech package that we put in that we can raise additional revenue for. Can we build back the water? Can we add additional amenities to charge for? All those things go into that equation for other income. 
Then we go have to go through the expenses and we take their what's called T12, trailing 12. So we have entire years worth of expenses and then we go line by line and look and see what they're doing versus what we think we can do. Three huge examples right now. First off, payroll. Payroll, like on the mark, their current payroll number is like $700 per unit. Well, we know it's gonna cost us $1,400 per unit to operate it um, because they were at lease up. They don't need very many maintenance people. Um, they, they can run it on a shorter staff plus because of the lease up, they had units come on time over time. So we know that 700 units is too low. We have to put in a market rent. I mean, a market expense for payroll. Insurance, insurance has skyrocketed over the last two years. We can plug in where our current rates are. The biggest single one though is property taxes. Property taxes in Texas, this is the worst part about, about Texas is the property taxes. But with no state income tax, they look for a way of, they have to raise revenue somehow, and all that's based on property taxes. And every year they reassess the value. The politicians get to say, we haven't raised taxes. BS. Um, property values go up, so they get a whole lot more tax revenue. But as politicians, they can say we didn't raise we didn't raise rates on a hundred million dollar property. They could have a tax value right now of thirty five million dollars. Well, we know that that's going to go way up, so we have to underwrite to what we think that's going to do, which is usually 80, 85 percent, unless there's some other compelling reason to change it. And I mean, eighty five percent of purchase price times the mill rate. So those are areas of expenses that we have to go ahead and plug in there. What are, how are we gonna operate that property? What are we gonna do that's different than what they had? And you know that income minus expenses equals net operating income. Net operating income divided by your cap rate gives you your value. So we can go in there and say, okay, the market cap rate right now is X. Or we take that NOI divided by what their asking price is and we can come up with a cap rate to see what the market cap rate is right now and see if that's in line with the overall market. Then we budget that out five years. Then it's real easy. We can expand that out over the next five years with what will expenses go up and what will income go up. At the end of five years, what is that value? What is that NOI? Here is the single biggest thing. This is the single biggest problem in the industry. Your exit cap rate. That is the biggest driver of value um, because cash flow is going to be relatively relatively mild. It could be zero year one, it could be three year one, it could be five year one and that'll slowly go up but that's not where your biggest gain comes in. Your biggest gain comes in from the sale of the property and you have to project out where that cap rate will be. Last January they were looking at cap rates at three to three to four percent. Well, now with the interest rates over five, you would have a negative, uh, negative return on that. You're buying at a 4% return, but you're paying 5% on your debt. It doesn't make sense. So we have to bump up that exit cap rate. And again, I cannot stress enough. Any other PPM you look at, any other property you analyze, look at their exit cap rate to see if that's realistic. Because that one, just a little change, can drastically reduce your return. That's the single biggest area that people get taken advantage of. And a lot of people, when they'll say, look, it's got a projected 20% return per year or IRR. Well, what does that underwriting look like? How can, you, how can you tell? And we, part of our transparency is give the full underwriting so that you can see all those different variables. After we have all those variables, and it can come up with a return, then we have to verify all that data. So that gives us enough to make an offer, then we do due diligence and really refine to make sure everything is accurate. But all that goes into the total actual numbers of underwriting. It sounds like you have an incredible amount of analysis you do and a lot of variables. But with variables like that where expenses are kind of changing, you said insurance is going up, taxes are going up, what do you do to mitigate the risk as an investor when there is an element of a sales pitch to me as well of the kind of return I'm gonna get? Oh, that's what everybody looks at. As a matter of fact, they'll see a Facebook ad, projected 20% uh, IRR. Well, you call them on it, you get the information, it doesn't say how did you come up with that number? Right. 
I can make any property look good on paper, but that's part of us having the management then on the backside is, hey, we're the sponsors, we're underwriting it, we're analyzing it, now we gotta make it do what we said it would do. So our butt's on the line right there rather than like a broker who says, look how rosy this is. And you know, broker's packages are always great, but now you have to get down, what can you actually do? Another thing that the sellers do is say, if you do all of these things, your value is gonna go way up. Well, why didn't you do them? Okay, so all of these things come into play. You gotta get past all the sales BS and say, what will it really honestly do? And there's a little more, there's some science and there's some art to that, to come up with that total return. So do you think you take a very conservative approach when you kind of give those projections of what you think you're gonna give as a return? Absolutely, there's, I don't know, three or four of those areas that have a lot of dramatic improvement, uh, dramatic effect. Exit cap rates, number one, performer rents are number two. And those are the ones that are really, we have to give an educated guess. And so that's where really analyzing the rents to see what we can do, and then projecting out that exit cap rate. Those two things, we have to make sure that those are spot on or conservative. Some of the areas, there's some play in. If one of those is not too conservative, the other two are, I'm good. If two of them are not very conservative, but the third are, I'm, uh, I don't know about that. But if all three of them are not conservative, that's a no-go, that's, that's too much risk. So that then would be kicked out. Uh, I love that, and I, I appreciate that when I'm putting my money with you, I wanna make sure that you promise low and give high or promise low and at least maintain that area. And I've been so impressed with you doing these conservative investments and underwriting while still getting the performance you have over the years. I love that concept. Do you think with the current markets that the risk has gone up a lot or do you think the risk has gone down because the opportunities are bigger? The perceived risk is higher because of instability in the market. One of the other times we talked, we talked about the perception and the fear in the instability, which makes people pull back. Because the more instability, the more wildly all of those numbers can fluctuate. So we gotta make sure that we're very conservative on all of those numbers to make sure that in a tumultuous market, we can prepare for that. But part of the question you didn't ask is we try and project, when I analyze a property, my goal is to look and see what will the investor get. So a lot of people ask, what was your going in cap rate? A lot of times I don't even know, because I don't care. I, I wanna know what that property can do with me at the helm. And then I look at that as what will the investor get? What will we get you? Our goal is to project about a 16% per year average annual return. If that's close to 16, then we go on to the next step in this market that we've had over the last 12 years, I said, everybody's a hero. Well, we were projecting 16% return if we're just on a normal flat trajectory. This market went crazy, made everybody's numbers go through the roof. Ours have been through the roof. I think our average over the last 10 years is well over 40%. I didn't have anything to do with really going to make it 40%. I was shooting for 16. The market made it better but that 16% is conservative enough that even if the market stayed flat, I would probably would have been 18 to 20, but the market made it shoot up even more. And so I can't take credit for the market going up, but I can take blame for the market going down because I need to prepare for that downside to make sure that we can manage through whatever those downturns are. I know as an investor, I definitely want that in that aspect. As far as the down markets, you've been through multiple down markets. Can you think of a time where you went out of your way to protect the investor's capital and to mitigate risks for them and you're successful in doing that? Well, we do that every single time. Um, but a good example is we, proper, we bought a property in a suburb of Fort Worth called Azel. Azel had a total of 200 apartment units. Okay, not a lot and we bought a small property, it was 80 or 90 units, right across the street from the high school, great buy, nice property, we had our normal underwriting, we had this whole plan, but the whole town only had 200 units. We bought that about eight months later, we found out 
that they're planning on building a 200 unit property across the street. That doubles the total amount of units in that city. What happens when they got to lease those up? They can give specials. They're going to lower their rent to get everybody else to move over there. What happens to our rent? They go lower, our rents go lower. So what we decided is we said, we better sell this thing before those come online. So we sold that property very early. So our overall returns were an average of like 12% per year, very low compared to what we did, but we didn't have enough of the runway to really accelerate it. We thought we better get out of this deal and protect the, the investor's capital on that before we get stuck. Me as an owner, if it were just me owning that, if I owned all these properties by myself, my own money as a portfolio, I might've let that ride. But I can't do that with other people's money. I've got to protect your money and make decisions that are best for you and your investment. I love that. I mean, I, I would rather get my capital back mm -hmm. than lose it all in a riskier side bet or trying to ride it out, just trying to force and try to get those returns. Exactly. You know, money, especially even getting a return when you think you probably would have lost a lot in that aspect. What do you think is drives you to care so much about the investors? What drives me to take care of the investors? I'm sorry, I got a little distracted because I thought of another answer to the previous question. Okay. Because there are times when the returns are a little bit low. We sold another property and the returns were a little bit low. So I took my promote out of it. I didn't take any money out of that deal because it was lower than what we projected. So I wrote that off and I didn't take any profit on that so that they can get a better return. How many years were you in that and you still gained no money on it? I mean, as a, as a businessman, that just seems like a, a tough concept to do. Oh, it was, we were in that one uh, three or four years, but the, the market was turning on that. And uh, so we wanted to sell it. It was actually, we had problems on that one early on. The day after we bought it, it had a chiller. The chiller went out. That was an $80,000 uh, expense that we did not plan for. We had plenty of re reserves to take it, but now that depleted our cash. And then there was just constant problems with that property. And we fought for it all the time and ended up selling it. But over that time frame, it was just a little bit of a money pit. So there's a learning lesson on that one is you really don't, and it was in a marginal area. Um, so you definitely wanna make sure you're in better areas, better quality properties. And in this particular case, it was a small property. A smaller property has more risk than a larger property. Because if you have a large expense, it's spread out over a fewer amount of units, if you follow that. If you have a larger property, you can absorb a whole lot more problems. Well, it sounds like you have a ton of experience dealing with a lot of problems and a lot of different property types and being able to mitigate a lot of the risks, especially with those bigger ones. My question is, what do you think other investors are the common mistakes they make and pitfalls that they don't mitigate enough risk or just common areas where they fail? A huge business plan of a lot of sponsors the last 10 years is a fix and flip model, an HGTV model. And we're not trying to have that sexy quick flip. We're trying to be in it for the long haul and protect your capital. What a lot of other sponsors do is they will go in there and say, I'm gonna buy this property. I'm gonna have an adjustable rate mortgage first and foremost, so they can have a little bit lower payment. That exposes them to interest rate risk. And then they go in and say, I'm only going to improve 10% of the units. If it takes $20,000 per unit, to improve a property, and that's a high CapEx budget, by the way. They might budget, they're only gonna do 10 units. So they only have to budget $200,000 for that. And their idea is, we go in there, paint the exterior, improve the interiors of the units, lease those at a higher rental rate so that you can get that higher rental rate. And then we're gonna sell it with meat on the bone and basically sell it to the next guy say, We've already did all the exterior. We've done all the heavy lifting. All you have to do is improve all of the rest of the units and get that higher rent. A couple of the fallacies on that. First off, ev you might not get every unit to pay the higher rent because you might max out because of the area. The bigger issue with that is they're going in undercapitalized. As soon as they have a problem, they turn around and say, okay, I can't sell it now. Our interest rate went from 3% to 6%. We can't sell this property because the value is not there. The value has gone down. And if we sell it, we lose money. 
but they don't have enough money to sustain through those down markets. On a competitive side between myself and, a, and if I'm trying to buy the same property, my overall returns are gonna be lower because I'm gonna go in there fully capitalized to do all of the units. I'm gonna go in there with a slightly higher interest rate loan because I want it fixed for the protection. I'm gonna go in there and do all of the construction right rather than slapping lipstick on a pig. It was a great model for the people that did the fix and flips for the last 10 years, but it's a hot potato. I'm gonna buy it, do it, and toss it over to the next guy. Eventually, somebody's gonna catch that potato and be burned by it. And that's what's happening right now, is that they are not prepared for this. That's why I said there's gonna be blood in the water with those sponsors that are, that are underwater. It, it sounds like a, a lot of other investors are taking risk and not underwriting, trying to mitigate those risks, and people just coming in undercapitalized. Do you think with people not being able to mitigate the risks the way you are, that it's gonna allow more opportunities for you and the people that invest with you? Oh, absolutely. There's gonna be, the next year is gonna be very good on the buy side. So good, we're expanding our office, we're, we're gearing up for this. There's a self-fulfilling prophecy, I love it like in retail. If they think, oh, we're not gonna sell, let's take a car lot, we're not gonna sell very many cars, so we're gonna order fewer cars to have on the lot. And then once people come in to buy theirs and they buy all those cars, the owner says, the I was right, we could only sell that amount of cars. Well, that's because they ran out of inventory. Interest rates, they're going up, going down. There's a bunch of talks of whether it's gonna keep going up, it's gonna stay. What are you doing to ensure that when I invest with you, that is not gonna affect my return? We have to make an educated guess on what the market's gonna do. I remember the first time, first property we bought, where the interest rate was below 5%. It was at 4.85, and we're, yes, we got to look, look at that, how great we are, we got this low interest rate. Well, rates kept going down and down and down and down, and we had a fixed interest rate. Okay, this is one of the ways that we mitigate risk also. We used a fixed interest rate, so our payment stayed constant. If we would have had an adjustable, our rate would have been lower to begin with, and it would have went down over time. So we would have been able to make a lot more on the cash flow. Well, not a lot more, but substantially more. Then the risk is when we sold that property, um, we had a $22 million loan, and it's got what they call defeasance. It's a prepayment penalty, for lack of a better phrase. And they have to replace that debt by buying bonds. And so they're, they're paying lower for those bonds, which means that I have a $22 million loan. In this particular case, it cost me $27 million to pay it off. Now, that's a $5 million lost paycheck right there. However, I took that risk because if interest rates would have went up, if it, that would have been done last year, you know what? Um, the fixed rate loan, I still would have been safe. Interest rates were lower, I would have been hurt a lot by that. Even though we had to pay the higher defeasance amount, we had to pay $27 million on a $22 million loan, the biggest part of that gain was because the market went up. So we're not playing the market, but because the market did go up, we did have that big prepayment penalty, we could absorb that without having the risk. Other players would have, could have looked at that and said, you lost $5 million on that deal. Well. That's because the market went up so high. If the market would have stayed the same, I would have been fine. If the market would have dropped, I would have been fine. So two out of three options, I do better, and, but my risk is mitigated because if I have a prepayment penalty that's higher, that means that the values went down, interest, that interest rates went down, creating more value. So it's a way of mitigating that risk with the debt that you place on the property. So it sounds like getting that fixed interest rate, you're at least gonna stay even, but you're gonna protect yourself from that unlimited growth of the interest rate, which you would really lose a lot of money if you were stuck in a variable rate. Yes, and another point on that is those loans are assumable. So if interest rates did go up, then, and property values then correspondingly go down because cap rates go up, values go down, we've got a loan there that's assumable that has value um, to somebody else. So if the interest rates went up, 
they could assume our loan, but the values would be lower, but we have then value in our loan because it's assumable, so we protect ourselves in that manner as well. So can you do that whenever you're buying another one of these apartments, assume their loan when they bought at a lower interest rate? That's one of the plays right now, a very, very keen insight there. Um, because a lot of people have lower interest rate loans that are assumable because going out and getting new debt, you're going to spend a lot more. The problem right now is that you've got a lower loan to value. Let's just say you've got a $10 million property. They've got a $5 million loan. You've got to put 50% down, 50% down to go ahead and do that. That's one of the plays right now, though. If you can put more money down, of course, the more money you put out, the lower your overall yield goes down because you're putting more capital out. But the play is you buy that and then hold on to it and run through that. And as soon as interest rates are stable again and or go down, whatever it is, now you wait two or three years and you refinance and then you take that cash out. So you get a cash out refi, even though you put more money down and that's a way of controlling the property. You get a good return and you get a cash out refinance opportunity. It sounds like all of this is extremely complicated. You're analyzing a million things and you have an incredible team that's doing it all. I, I feel like I'm pretty smart and it was really hard to follow along in a <laughs> lot of that, but I'm really glad that you and your team are handling my money and making these investments for me because that sounds way too hard. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, you know, it's easier than you think, but again, I sometimes overthink it but uh, hopefully, hopefully I can get it to a level so you easily understand it in the future. But thank you so much. I look, for learning more, look forward to learning more and uh, I look forward to what you can do with the money I'm giving you. We'll do it.